Good morning and welcome to Data Palooza 2022. We are very excited to kick off our uh, main programming with concurrent research lightning talks and, and the virtual um, session that you are joining us is on data design. And we are very lucky to have three wonderful speakers today. And I'm gonna kick it off so that we can stay on time since we've got a lot to cover. Uh, kick it off with uh, Alexander Gates. Thanks, and I'll just pull up the slides. Uh, okay. <clears throat> so thank you all for coming today. I'm sorry we can't actually be sharing the physical space, but it's fun to be able to share this work virtually with all of you. Um, my name is Alex Gates. I am an assistant professor here in the School of Data Science, and I direct the Connected Data Hub. Today, I'll be sharing some of the data design tools and insights we've gathered from being able to sculpt and actually explore networks. And before I begin, I should recognize that all of this work was done with my longtime collaborator and friend, Alice Gershenko. So for those of you who are skimming through and only are going to watch the first slide, here are my key takeaways. One, networks are all around us, but understanding networks from a single image can sometimes be very difficult. So I'm planning to introduce three projects from my lab that leverage dynamic interactivity to enhance our understanding of networks. But wait, what is a network and why is it important to visualize them? Well, for those of you who've never seen this framework before, a network is built from two types of objects, nodes and edges. The power of network science extends from the fact that nodes can literally be anything. People universities, publications, neurons, proteins, galaxies, and even other networks. Well, edges can capture any type of relationship between pairs of nodes. Many of the most important questions can then be translated into questions about the network. So for example, is the network connected? Who are the most important nodes in this network? And are there groups of similar nodes? In the Connected Data Hub, we use the framework of network science to model and understand how connectivity shapes the social, scientific, and business world around us. If these questions interest you, please consider taking my graduate class next semester, DS8104, Network Science, or feel free to reach out to me for research opportunities in the group. A fundamental aspect of network science is visualization. A good network visualization tells a compelling story and leads you towards informative feature of the structure. Network visualization is particularly important when we have additional information about the nodes and edges. For example, why are all of the green and orange nodes connected to each other? Or what makes those blue or red nodes so special? Often though, we're faced with data deluge. There are just too many different properties to consider. It's here that interactive visualization really shines. So let me introduce you to one such case. A few years ago, we were approached by a program in a prominent national science funding agency to review the last 20 years of a grant given and assess if these interdisciplinary grants actually promoted the program's mission of building a research community. To answer this question, we built the co-authorship network using publications produced as a result of the grant funding. This network has two types of nodes. One set of nodes are the publications, here colored in orange, and the other sets of nodes are the authors, colored in blue. An author is connected to the publications on which they worked. And the size of the node reflects the number of these connections in which the author or publication participates. We can immediately see the huge variability. Most authors only write a single publication, while well, a few have participated in up to 26 publications over the course of the 20 years. This network also captures the various communities of practice contributing to knowledge production. We can project the network onto the author nodes where now two authors are connected if they co-wrote a publication together. And we can reveal the, the social structure of the grant program. A few prominent islands dominate the center of the picture, yet most of the authors are found in the many isolated and disconnected components scattered throughout. The structure of these collaborations reflect one aspect of the grants program success in bringing together different communities, but also reveals that it has some connections that can still be made. We can also recolor our network based on the expertise of the authors as we've inferred them from their complete publication. 
we see that the program's authors overwhelmingly come from psychology, sociology, and political science. Yet we can also see significant contributions from engineering, computer science, and medicine. The clusters of same colored authors show that many publications result from collaborations between authors of the same discipline. But there are few multicolored clusters that reveal interdisciplinary knowledge production. Let's bring back the publications. Of course, all of this knowledge didn't spontaneously come into being. It's the result of two decades of funding and grant giving. We can see this explicitly by positioning authors and publications by their first publication date. Here, the center of the figure is the year 2001 and time increases as you move radially outwards. This layout demonstrates both that most publications reflect new authors joining the network, while only a few individuals have been publishing throughout the whole 20 years of the grant program. But we also see how larger collaborations become much more prevalent throughout the two decades. This network visualization is fully interactive and hosted online. We've had great success showing it to the program directors and researchers responsible for this grant giving program. And I encourage you to explore it as well. Just follow the QR code here. By allowing the domain experts to rearrange and layer in different types of information, this interactive network empowers our understanding of funding for community building. Okay, let's shift gears just a little bit and focus on another project looking at interdisciplinarity in science. A few years ago, we were developing methods to quantify the interdisciplinarity of a scientific publication based on the network of other publications it has referenced. We stumbled on an interesting finding that the interdisciplinarity of the average publication has increased over the last century. But when we move the methods to analyze groups of publications, say selected by a journal, we realized that the average just didn't mean very much. Journals presented a rich diversity of interdisciplinarity. A great example of this is the journal Nature, one of the oldest and most prestigious scientific venues. To illustrate what I mean, we can visualize the diversity of a journal's publications using a co-citation network. Here, each node is a publication and two publications are connected if they are referenced by some other piece of publication in the body of scientific knowledge. Nature's so co-citation network then looks like this, where we've colored where we've colored the publications based on their primary discipline. I think it's pretty beautiful. But when we presented, presented it to a few editors, the reception fell a little flat. Like there's just too much going on, I think. Right? Where are the important areas in this picture? Which publications are most interesting from an interdisciplinarity point of view? So we thought, how can we explore this network in such a way that it emphasizes the diverse landscape over which the nodes are living and accentuates the important groups that we want them to focus on? That's when we realized that we needed to take networks to another dimension. So here's that same network, but rendered in 3D, where we raise nodes along the z-axis based on our measure of uh, interdisciplinarity importance. Now I feel the clusters which were unimportant kind of fade away and we're able to more clearly see how the publications are organized. But wait, there's more. Let's actually explore this. So this network is hosted online and it's fully interactive. Um, you can rotate it around, kind of zoom in and out and shift your point of view. Ultimately, this 3D interactive visualization captures the rich diversity of publications. So I really like to show that there's some areas of it that are highly monochromatic, right? These are publications that are all coming from the same discipline and are viewed as being related to each other only to those from the same discipline. Well, there's other areas of the network over like over here where we see a rich swirl of different publications from many different disciplines. And these are publications that really have a highly interdisciplinary uh, impact as they've been used by, by um, many different types of scientific works. So I encourage you to also play with this. This is hosted on Nature's website now, and you can go around and click 
and actually find uh, individual publications that might be of interest to you. Or we've highlighted in here a few publications that uh, nature themselves have identified as being important uh, for the history of the journal. And let's go back. Yeah. Most recently, we've been grappling with trying to understand how these inter networks interact with our everyday lives. Everyone is embedded in a complex web of social relationships with our friends, families, colleagues, and peers. We intuitively understand how to navigate these relationships but often the larger scale features of the system remain hidden from our view. It's not always clear beyond our immediate neighbors who else is related to whom. So for example, when you look at a room full of faculty, each of these individuals is connected to many others through the set of hidden relationships, including co-authorship, shared expertise, and even extracurricular activities. Right now, my lab is developing an augmented reality application that will empower us to reveal these otherwise invisible relationships. While it's still very much a work in progress, the goal is to deploy this application at conferences or meetings, allowing the user to navigate the web of social relationships and identify pertinent individuals with whom they should connect. So in conclusion, I hope this talk has offered a tantalizing example of the power of network visualization and interactive design to help elucidate some of the organizing principles of knowledge production and science. The connected data hub that I run engages in a constellation of other projects and has won actually numerous awards for some of these data visualizations that we've built to communicate our work. So please visit my website to learn more and I thank you all for your attention today. And I'm happy to take a few questions now uh, while the next speaker gets prepared. Yes, if you have any questions for any of our presenters, go ahead and put them in the chat, which we will be moderating. Thank you. I understand everybody went online and is engaging with the networks now. So if you have any questions later on, you can feel free to email me too. And if you would prefer to use the Q&A feature, we can moderate the Q&A feature as well. Chat or Q&A. Any questions for Alex Gates? Okay, well, thank you very much, Alex. Mm -hmm. My pleasure. Okay, we are moving on to our second uh, faculty lightning research talk, and we have Elvita Otley joining us from uh, Washington University in St. Louis, and I will give the floor to her. Thank you. Uh, just want to verify can you see my speaker view or the actual slides we are seeing the speaker view okay um, sorry give me one second that is quite right we are ahead of schedule is it better yes now we can see the presentation thank okay. you fantastic uh well, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Alvita Ali, and I'm an assistant professor at Washington University in St. Louis. And uh, today I'm going to be talking about the work that we've been doing um, on learning from interaction traces, representations, models, and predictions. So I think like Alex did a really good job building up the importance of visualization and and actually why we do the work that we do. So like Alex presented a really cool and frankly, beautiful network visualization that's on the nature website. But for a, a, a user like me who know nothing about like the, the history of nature and looking at that complex data, it's really difficult to navigate that space because you have a large data set. And so one of the things that we try to do in our lab is try to figure out 
how can we learn from interactions? How can we learn about your task and help you complete a task? And so, um, as I said, I run, I'm at WashU and uh, I run their visual data analysis group. And I just wanted to present my students because they're the ones who lead this lead this work. I'm, so I don't want to take credit for all the work. Uh, so fundamentally, we think of human computer collaboration as a spectrum and where you go from really human heavy to machine heavy. And I really do think of visualization as a human computer collaboration. The type of work that we do sit in the center of this, where we try to figure out from a very human centric um, way the human is controlling a visualization, how can we embed active learning to assist that user? But also on the other end of the spectrum, we think about how can we embed humans in the active learning process so that we can um, create more effective applications. And if you think about a traditional, um, a traditional situation where someone is using a visualization, you would see they, they might use a visualization to generate hypotheses, they might want to reason with the data, they make deductions, they make judgments, and all of this is, is, is based on the interactions with the data. Um, embedded in this relationship as well, the humans also bring their biases, their knowledge, their personal abilities, their preferences, and of course, specific tasks. So what we try to do is learn from learn about all of these different things from interactions, which is a large task, but we've been chipping away at it for several years now. So fundamentally, what our group is trying to figure out is what can we infer from interaction traces and how do we create effective human AI partnership in visual analytics? Uh, the big goal here and the types of questions that we ask and the things that we try to do is that we use psychology to understand individual differences and how people use visualization problems. So like we do have to understand humans in order to make a dent in this problem. Um, we also then apply machine learning to model and predict behavior. And we try to exp um, provide exploration guidance. Um, and some of this is like perform pre-computation based on what I think someone might want to look at next. But we also make recommendations based on what we believe people are interested in. Uh, we, of course, when you're making recommendations, this also impose, might impose bias into the analysis scenario. So we try to analyze the impact of guidance on decisions. Uh, specifically, we're now really focused on this idea of trust because this is an issue where if someone doesn't trust the computer at all, they would ignore the suggestions. But on the other end of the spectrum, if someone over trusts the computer, then they might take suggestions that are not necessarily um, beneficial to the decision making process. And so we really want to encourage partnerships. And a part of this partnership is calibrating the right level of trust and making sure that it is indeed an equal partnership. So before we started this entire process, there were some existing work in this area. So for instance, in the past in machine learning, um, there are there were some prior work where they looked at interaction logs and they can authenticate a user. I can identify someone just based on their keystrokes. And that's what, that, that was work that was done back in like 2004. Um, there were work there, there has been some work in the visualization community that showed that, and this is through manual analysis, they were able to look at interaction logs and predict people's strategies. So a bunch, a, a separate set of analysts were able to look at someone's interaction logs and tell you what someone was trying to do, which was one of the first studies that um, was a catalyst for work in this area. And some of my prior work as well, we show that um, offline, we can do analyses and actually predict personality traits. So by looking at what people click on, how they navigate through a data space, I can predict things like how much of an extrovert are you or what are, what are your personality characteristics as it pertains to neuroticism. So, so in the past, I know that like there was some existing work and we were trying to see, can we do this in real time? And uh, to get you an idea of like what we're talking about, I wanna present a simple scenario. So here I'm showing you a visualization that shows like individual reported crimes in St. Louis. 
and the color of the dots would denote the types of crimes that we're seeing. And here's a hypothetical user clicking on crimes in this green area. And so you as an individual might look at this and say, okay, this person might be interested in either the blue dots in this area or now you're seeing the looking at the pink stuff. So they wanna see potentially what are the crimes that happen in this park? And so we're trying to figure out when we started this project, can we teach an algorithm to make that inference that a human can make? So at a high level, the goal was to look at passive observations and to see if we can model and predict actions before they occur. This is fundamentally machine learning for time series, but here we assume that the samples arrive sequentially. The sample size is unknown, so I have no idea how many points someone would click on. And uh, um, the data, there, we, I don't have any data. We assume that we don't have any data for training because one of the things that we are wanting to do, we wanna be able to deploy these kind of algorithms like online. And so I can't assume that I know what the data is gonna be, what people are gonna click on. And I also can't assume that learning from one user is gonna to translate to another user. Um, we also can't assume that we can wait until time T to accumulate a batch because it is possible that someone only clicks on five points. So we wanna be able to create algorithms that can go in with um, some notion of um, some notion of a prior belief so that they can learn really quickly and support a user even with a small sample size. So to do this, um, this is one of the algorithms that we proposed uh, and developed in our lab. So we use a hidden Markov model to represent evolving attention. And I'm gonna spare the details of what a hidden Markov model is, but I'm happy to answer questions about it, but I wanna give you an intuition for how one of these algorithms work. So, how do we make predictions? We use this thing called uh, um, a particle filtering. And so how this work is that this is what I'm showing you is what the machine believes that happening. And so we have a screen here with lots of point on a map, lots of point. And here the machine believes that a points are everywhere. A user might click on anything anywhere and there could be any color. Uh, one of the things that you might realize here that there are some points here without color was say that human can click on something in that location, but they don't really know, the machine doesn't know what color it is. So the way this evolves is that this is what the machine believes at time T equals zero. So nothing has happened yet. So someone might click on a dot and this orange dot, it's orange square represents what someone might click on. And so you see that evolves over time and what the machine believes would change based on what someone's clicked. And so here, for instance, someone is clicking on lots of red points where the orange, the red square represent the points and these particles represent the machine's belief. And so the particle is telling me here is that uh, a lot of the points are located in this specific area, which is actually wrong because the red square is over on that side, but the particles also believe that what someone is interested in is all red. And so the way that works is that we take this particle representation and then we map it to points on a map. So now all of these particles would vote for whatever is on the map. And what we're showing here highlighted are the top 100 things that the particle thinks that the user might be interested in. Uh, so this is like just like a high level explanation of what's going on in the back end. And I'm trying to spare the details because, but. But it actually, so here's one representation of how we think about how attention evolves and how we might represent that in a machine learning algorithm. But as you know, all models are wrong, but some of them are useful. And so we wanted to understand how useful this model was. We did use the studies. We tend to use the studies for all of our algorithms because that's the best way of testing. Uh, so we did a study where we, uh, recruited people on Amazon Mechanical Turk. There were 30 sub subjects, 17 of them were women, and the average age were, was 33. Uh, we had three types of tasks. One of them was a type-based task where we asked people to like find the homicides, for instance. There was a geo-based task where we asked people to interact with things in a red-shaded region. And there was a mixed type task where we asked people to interact with the red-shaded region, 
and look at specific types of crime. So we wanted to stress test this algorithm to see how might different tasks affect the predictive capability of the algorithm. Uh, after data cleaning, we had, a, a, so all, so we, there were 30 participants and they did all of the different types of tasks. And after data cleaning, we had about 180 trials. Uh, sorry, we had 180 trials after, after data cleaning, which meant that we removed people. And this is normal for mechanical Turk studies. When you do online studies, there are a lot of people who are just clicking through to get paid. So we removed people who weren't actually doing the task. But when we do that, we look then at the accuracy of the algorithm. And the way we calculate the accuracy is the number of successful predictions over the total number of predictions. And here I'm showing you a bar chart that shows you accuracy on the y-axis and the type of task on the x-axis for k equals 100, which means that the machine learning algorithm will say, I, I believe that the next click would fall into the subset of 100. And this represents about 5% of the overall data set. And so you can see the average um, accuracy here was around 95%. So overall, across all tasks, the algorithm was pretty accurate at predicting um, the set of points that someone might be interested in. We also wanted to see how this accuracy might change over time. And so um, here on the, y, on the x axis, I'm showing you the number of clicks that we observed and the accuracy on the y axis. And what you can see here is that at after four observations, the algorithm was able to predict at a fairly high accuracy. So um, to summarize, um, here I'm presenting just one of our algorithms, which is a framework for representing modeling and predicting latent attention. Um, and we demonstrate that this can be done fairly accurately. Some of our current work though, is like trying to expand on this notion, because as you can see, we can only predict really low level stuff, what someone might click on next. And uh, that's something that we're trying to evolve. So currently we're trying to think about um, user modeling as a Bayesian model selection problem. And so here, I'm like, this is just like a, an abstract representation of what I mean. You might have a model A that represents a specific belief or a specific way someone might explore the data. Um, you have a model B and a model C. So you might have several models that describe how someone might investigate a specific data set. Uh, Bayesian model selection, what it does, it, it, it allows us to create mathematical representations of these models. And then with a specific observation, we can then compare these different models to um, create a statistical probability distribution of um, the likelihood that this model represents the observations that we're making. Uh, so this is where we're trending. This is a hard problem. So I would love to hear thoughts about how we might be able to um, predict higher level reasoning and if there are any other prior work that you guys might be doing. But again, I want to acknowledge the students that lead this project and I am happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Aruta. Again, feel free to pose your questions either in the Q&A or in the chat. I see Alex Gates has his hand raised. Hi, Alex. Yeah. Thank you, Vita. That was a really lovely presentation. Um, I'm wondering a little bit about like how the actual visualization gets represented in the data that you're mining. So is it like the prior of where individuals are clicking, or is it like the the thought the, the original color of the dots, or is it um, not actually represented and you're just capturing the the individual users' uh, behaviors? Uh, so in so in this specific algorithm that I presented, the way it's represented, so I'm the the visualization is indeed represented. So we consider the different points on the map, so the different colors, and we rep, and we think about the different position. So essentially, we deconstruct the visualization into its low level features. So any feature that's in the visualization is represented as in this latent space. And so, essentially, what it translates to is saying. 
we believe that someone might be interested in colors or we might we believe that someone might be interested in location and uh like it's all combination of all different features so this is actually a big model space uh but then and then we based on those we then try to figure out which one of these models best represents um the observations that we see with the interactions and so when we observe an interaction what we're seeing what the algorithm is seeing is that someone clicked on a red dot in a specific location with all of these features and so after like a sequence of actions, what we can say is, what do these have in, sim in what do these collection of points have uh, like in common? And then try to figure out which model best represent it. Uh, there are some algorithms that we've developed that don't think about the visualization at all, but think broadly of the data space because it assumes that the visualization is only showing a subset of the data. And by doing that, we can then perhaps recommend other data points that are not being currently being visualized. Thank you. And it looks like we have a few questions coming in over the Q&A, Alvita. Can you see those or would you like me to read them out? I, oh, okay. I Yes, I can. I wonder how we can figure out people's response with intention, because I believe people sometimes act with Without any intention. Yes, I agree 100%. So a lot of the times when we look at these, uh, when I was describing it, I talked about clicks and uh, we focused on clicks because clicks are intentional and we ignore things like hovers because hovers can be unintentional. Um, some of the times we capture hovers by looking at a threshold. So if you hover for something, hover on something for more than um, a particular number of minutes, then we would consider that, but um, so far our our observations are just somewhat limited to either a single set of interactions or we assume that all the interactions are equally important, which is somewhat flawed. So I can see ways that we can um, improve our models by trying to figure out maybe kind of weights the interaction. So maybe hovers are not as important as, cl as clicks and like think about the different types of interactions, but that's still stuff that we're working on. Uh, but I think that's a really great point. Um, thinking about interactions that are that are intentional and th and, th and separating those from those that are unintentional. But I actually do think that you can learn a lot from unintentional interactions as well. Uh, you might be surprised how many things that we do subconsciously that can actually identify us. Uh, I can. I'm happy to type an answer to the rest of them online so that we can move on to the next speaker. But these are really great questions. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Alvita, and for joining us from the Midwest. Of course. <laughs> Thanks for having me. OK, we're going to move on to Sarah Riggs, who is an associate professor of systems engineering here at UVA. And I will give the floor to her. All right, let me share my screen. Can everyone see things OK? Yes. All right, perfect. Um, make sure everything's showing up right for me too. Okay. All right. Um, so thank you all for inviting me today. I'm super excited to talk about, um, just in general, I think, the, um, all the speakers up until now have really set the stage for me. So I really, I'm excited. Um, um, Alice's talk was kind of visualizing this, uh, complex network. Um, and then Alvito was talking about the, the importance of incorporating the humans, um, and, um, the goal of my talk today is to kind of really hash the importance of the human um, and that AI has a lot of potential, especially in addressing issues like data overload. Um, so I'm looking from the work I'm doing, looks at complex environments, dynamic environments that are constantly changing um, and that AI can really help. But then if we don't take into consideration how people are going to adopt, accept, um, or trust um, these aspects um, with regards to the AI, um, it's not going to be successful. So um, in general, I'm going to talk a little bit of some of the stuff that's ongoing in my lab, uh, which is kind of a, a mesh of a lot of stuff that um, we have been perennially doing um, since the, the start of my lab. Um, so uh, I think the general message again is to make sure that the humans are incorporated in the loop um, and then that uh, a lot of the work that needs to be done from a research perspective 
is essentially boils down to presenting the right information at the right time and also in the right medium and form, which is really challenging um, with the advances in AI because a lot of this stuff is pretty complex. So to make sure that we're kind of on the same page, um, I think collaborative AI is um, kind of self-explanatory that AI is viewed more as a team member um, and that people work with it uh, much like a team. Um, I wanted to give a general definition about um, what explainable AI is. And um, generally for artificial intelligence, um, there's some sort of input. Um, here's an example where we are looking at um, uh, a UAV and uh, it could detect, um, there's kind of growing interest in using AI to detect you know, visual targets and things. Um, but the kind of the general framework thus far is that there's some sort of input, some depending on some sensors, the goes in some sort of black box and then the output for the user, which often is still uh, to date the human, that it just indicates that you know, some target was detected. Um, so for explainable AI, um, the paradigm's a little bit different. Um, similarly, the AI can do what usually what AI does, um, goes into a black box um, in terms of the model development. And then the output is ideally is paired with some sort of explanation. So um, in this case, um, if you look at the comparison between these two, we have the general that target was detected. Um, there's no explanation as to what it was, um, but here we have um, kind of, uh, you might not be able to see it very well, a area in which the target may be uh, kind of the hot spot. So this gives some more context as to what the AI is doing, kind of the underlying, uh, um, uh, foundation as to why it's making decision it is. Um, so this is kind of what uh, explainable AI is um, compared to just regular AI. So ideally with regards to this, um, the there's a, a bunch of research looking at explainable AI and how do we effectively present this information um, is kind of uh, an ongoing research question um, for uh, my lab and then also for others um, as well. So in terms of this explainable AI situation, there are also a lot of other contextual concerns as well. Um, so um, and from a systems level, um, especially when you introduce AI, there and in these environments I've been talking about that's uh, data rich, complex, that adding an AI could increase the workload um, of the user, which isn't going to be helpful. Um, and then also workload does change as well. So environmental concerns on which the AI is adopted is also something that needs to be taken into account as well. So the reason that we need explanations is that with AI, the level of model complexity is um, also uh, uh, increasing. So here is um, on the top, we have kind of a spectrum of um, explanations, complexities. Um, at the very basic level, we have a decision tree, kind of a very, very binary world. Uh, we have linear aggression, um, and then we all we move to uh, you know neural networks, which are more uh, much more difficult to understand. Um, they can take in a lot more variables uh, simultaneously, but along the way, um, in terms of explaining to people that might be adopting um, these uh, models, what's going on behind the scenes is also really critical. So. Um, the reason that we need to provide these explanations is that with regards to every model, um, I think Alvita mentioned this in her talk as well, that um, there are good models, um, and then also there are also bad models as well, that the models are somewhat fragile um, and can be as well. So here we have an, um, an AI that can detect various things. Um, so the top is, you know, a zero, but if you add just a little bit of more, um, I guess, uh, uh, noise in the image, it might be identified as a five. Um, same thing with the second uh, pair of images um, that we have a, a number three. Uh, if it's a little bit more pixelated, it becomes interpreted as number eight. And you can see that there are many uh, instances where just some slight nuance of the picture may be interpreted um, to be different. So these were from a very, uh, I guess, laboratory-based setting, um, uh, testing the AI, but this is also has been um, kind of, uh, has happened in the real world. Um, so this was a situation where um, essentially the Tesla autopilot was tricked 
um, to interpret this speed limit, um, this was a study done, um, of not being 35 miles per hour, but 85 miles per hour, uh, which is a little bit problematic if you are in the automated driving mode. So this concept of model fragility um, goes to the historical, um, at least literature on brittleness in terms of um, automation. Um, and again, uh, the field that I've usually been in-house under is, I would say, like human factors. Um, and there's been a lot of work looking at the brittleness of automation. Um, and with regards to AI, there's a lot of parallels with regards to brittleness and automation and also the brittleness in, um, uh, in AI as well. So again, um, given that there is a growing complexity of AI and the, and the models, um, and then also um, there is this brittleness that uh, one recommendation is that we incorporate these explanations, which kind of goes full circle to what I mentioned before. And um, there's also a reason of, as to why we need an explanations is that there are probably different stakes um, in the environment, um, if we have a situation where there's low stakes, if um, I would say this is a general like recommender system where if you wanted to buy this crab, usually people also buy this cowboy hat. Um, these are generally like low stakes um, uh, situations. Um, going back to the in, uh, initial example, which is a, a domain, um, a work domain that is, um, has been uh, uh, studied in my lab is kind of UAV control um, is that if an AI is to assist um, the operator in identifying possible targets, um, that these are a lot more high stakes involved. And uh, we wanna make sure that, um, especially from the user standpoint and kind of a, a ramification standpoint that the AI is accurate um, and that it actually helps assist people in making decisions. Um, but there's a lot of considerations along the way to make sure um, that we need to take into account to make sure that people will readily adopt AI, uh, whether it's uh, 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 accurate, um, these are all kind of things that kind of need to be taken into account. So with regards to, kind of, uh, with regards to regulations, um, there's also kind of a systems level um, uh, uh, considerations such as, um, uh, especially from the, the EU where there's already um, AI Act um, that needs to uh, kind of a uh, kind of little bit uh, structure to the AI development. So again, uh, with regards to AI, when kind of, uh, and taking into account the users that uh, in terms of ambiguous responsibilities and actions that we probably need to solidify those. Um, and then actually explanations can be a method to possibly improve the adoption of technology and also the AI models um, that perhaps may be hesitant um, to be initially adopted by users. So to date, um, there has been, um, several flavors, I guess, of a, uh, explainable AI explanations. Um, we have global, local, and then kind of this mixed uh, variety. So um, the global uh, explanation uh, basically uh, explains the complete behavior of the model. Um, these uh, and kind of just gives you a general kind of bird's eye view of what's going on. Um, the local explanation, so the first one here, we have a FICO score situation um, that this is what's contributing to your FICO score. Um, and then if we have a local explanation, um, this is one that are the factors that are directly leading to your score. So uh, perhaps uh, this will specify in this situation, um, what are some, uh, what's helping a person score, and then also what's bringing down your score. So this gives you kind of an additional layer. Um, and then we also have this mixed model explanation, which is kind of a combination of both that we get both the, you know, the global, some global aspects and also some more local aspects. So this again, um, are some of the, the ways that have, uh, uh, of um, explanations that have accompanied AI uh, to date. But, for today's talk, what I really want to emphasize is that um, there is a need for the development of these explanations more from a human factors and also human computer interaction perspective. And um, this kind of circles back to me really emphasizing the importance of, you know, uh, humans, which is both pre the word is present in human factors and also human computer interaction. Um, so I think the paradigm to date with regards to AI 
has been um, the AI will exist, um, and then it, this will take the place of a human, and that we don't, we no longer need a human. Um, and just putting my human factors hat on, that I would vouch that this is not the best solution. Um, instead, that I think an ideal solution um, in a world with AI is that we have a collaborative situation where we have AI and humans kind of working together. So again, um, in a general of general uh, uh, excellent uh, situation where people are collaboratively working together. So sans AI, just people working together. Um, there typically needs to be mutual understanding of capabilities, uh, what people are good at, um, and then understanding kind of context and how people should work together. I would argue that um, in developing these human AI collaboration that um, same things need to be taken into consideration. Um, and then also the way that you present this information has a, goes a, lo a long way in um, supporting the successful AI um, team collaboration. So kind of to reiterate um, this AI human collaboration, um, instead of kind of uh, AI can be more or less, um, this is an analogy used by um, Nancy Cook, who is a professor at ASU looking at teamwork of AI and um, people is that possibly we can view AI as uh, kind of a dog counterpart. So we have situations where there are um, natural disasters um, and then there are jobs that are really good for people to do. Um, and then also there are jobs that if we have a dog helper that they can do um, and then they work together to uh, um, help people in disasters. And I would argue that that should ideally be the way that we view AI as well, that there are good things that people can do. Um, uh, we know based on you know, psychology, uh, sociology, that, that uh, what are some of the um, positives and negatives of, of people's capabilities and limitations. Um, and then also identifying what those are with regards to AI as well. Um, so another aspect that we need to take in consideration um, um, and it was mentioned in the previous talk was that uh, this trust in, a, uh, in automation as well. Um, so there's a lot of uh, work that has been done in trust and automation. Um, I would say AI is kind of an advancement over just an automated process, which is, you know, uh, prescribed to do one thing. AI has the ability to kind of change over time. So um, a lot of the foundational work that has gone into trust and automation, I think also apply to um, trust in AI as well. So what we really want to do is make sure that uh, we properly calibrate trust. So um, if we have on the y-axis um, operator trust and then on the x-axis um, AI reliability, we ideally would have kind of a one-for-one -one match between those both. What is a problem is that if the AI reliability is not, um, uh, is uh, people overestimate the AI's reliability, um, that we have a situation where we have overtrust. Um, and then also there's a situation where we undertrust the AI as well, and this is also problematic. So overtrust, again, giving too much um, trust to the AI uh, can lead to problems, especially if the AI is making um, incorrect uh, recommendations or decisions. Um, but then also the undertrust situation is also problematic as well. So if you think about in a teamwork setting, um, if someone's not pulling their weight, you're going to start um, adding more workload to yourself. And um, the premise of the AI is to, it's supposed to offload, um, ideally, the workload of an individual. So we also want to avoid the under trust situation. So this delicate balance that's right in the middle um, is really challenging to maintain as well. So in general, with regards to AI, um, uh, expl explainable AI, um, it's a really delicate balance. Um, and it's been shown that explanations can go a long way. So if it's in, uh, implemented correctly, um, it improves this trust calibration. So eventually the user can uh, make a decision about whether or not they want to trust AI or not. Um, but the addition of this explanation also adds to the mental resources that are also limited um, and, and needed to process what is going on with the explanation. Um, and then on the flip side, if it's not presented in the right way, this explanation, um, it's going to be hard to interpret and, um, uh, again, kind of lead to this kind of clumsy situation. So um, in general, it's been found 
that the presence of an AI, uh, of explainable AI can uh, kind of move towards this bias of overtrust. So again, this kind of really emphasizes the fact that this is a really delicate balance and that if explainable AI is an option, um, that we need to really be careful in terms of how we present this information so that people can, one, calibrate their trust appropriately um, and then kind of make make sense of the, what the AI is uh, um, uh, trying to, what, what that information is trying to, trying to present. So in terms of kind of future research, um, there are a lot of things at play and a lot of this goes back to um, the situation that um, the of the environments that we uh, the my lab studies. Um, so again, these are really data rich, complex, dynamic environments. Um, so one thing in these types of environments is kind of underlying um, uh, thing that uh, uh, underlines how anybody engages with any technology in these environments is that does it get someone's attention? So um, if we design an explanation um, and it is not noticeable um, and even if the explanation is amazing and no one's paying attention to it, it's not going to be very effective. Um, also in uh, the contextual consideration that we need to take into account is workload. So um, again, think back to these really complex data rich environments. Workload is not only changes over time, but there can be periods of low workload and also high workload as well. Um, so one um, domain I have been um, uh, uh, done research in is, for example, their aviation. There are low periods of low workload and also high workload throughout um, the, the task of a pilot um, and takeoff and landing um, and then also cruise. So in terms of um, explainable AI, um, there needs to be more work done on how workload modulates people's tendency to whether or not they need to trust the AI or uh, rely on the AI. Um, and again, if there's a mismatch um, between what people expect and what the AI capabilities are, again, this leads to some um, challenges. Um, also, kind of thinking back to the environments that I'm interested in, um, usually in a multitasking environment, so um, priority of tasks, types of tasks, these are also things to take into account. Um, in terms of explainable AI, like what types of tasks would uh, is best suited um, for you know ex explainable AI to uh, present information, um, and also some of the stuff that we I've talked about earlier in terms of rewards and consequences. Um, we have low key consequences just you know from a shopping, and then also all the way to the more extreme consequences, which have to do with uh, UAV command and control. Um, also, um, in terms of rewards, um, there's this kind of debate in terms of what guides our visual attention. Um, that a lot of it can be from the environment that guides where we, what we care about, what we look at. Um, but there's also in terms of things that we need to take in consideration, like training that can guide people to consider um, some uh, uh, look at, you know, AI and its explanation in different ways, um, if that is emphasized. So again, um, this really begs the question in terms of explainable AI implementation that we really need to take into account a lot of contextual um, considerations with regards to different environments. Um, in, and we wanna really avoid this clumsy automation situation, um, which also has its uh, 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 carry over to uh, possibly this idea of maybe clumsy AI as well. So one thing I wanna emphasize is that with regards to clumsy automation, it kind of connotates that it's kind of clumsy, what it really means with regards to clumsy automation, the canonical definition is that the automation is very helpful um, in kind of these low workload periods. And then during high workload, it is not helpful and actually adds to the burden of what the person needs to consider. So um, that has been studied um, historically with regards to human factors um, field. It also has ramifications in terms of how people should ideally deal with um, AI as well. So we really wanna avoid this um, clumsy AI and um, the underlying thing that could possibly prevent that is the way that the information that, uh, that AI presents is um, and how it's presented. So just some ongoing work um, in the lab. Um, uh, Jawad, um, uh, one of my students, um, he is looking at um, the trust and over trust in a primary task and also secondary tasks. So in these environments I've been talking about, there's usually a lot of multitasking. There's usually one priority for one task, but there's a slew of other tasks as well. Um, so we're investigating this in the context of UAV control. Um, ideally, we will figure out some way to model 
um, effectively trust and kind of uh, an operator trust and uh, AI reliability, um, taking into consideration some of the um, aspects uh, we've, um, uh, technology we've used in our lab, um, which includes eye tracking technology. So again, where people look is a really great way to see what is effective and what's not. Um, and we have done model this um, uh, kind of in a Marconi framework. We have used other um, uh, methods as well. Um, and that could hopefully ideally feed into some general guidelines about how we how uh, explainable AI should be presented to make sure that uh, it takes into consideration types of tasks, whether it's primary or other secondary tasks as well. So that is what uh, Jawad is doing for his dissertation. Um, and then my other student who is in this uh, um, uh, AI space um, is Nicholas. Um, and he is looking at um, teamwork in collaborating with um, GitHub Copilot, which is um, an AI, I guess, agent that can generate um, uh, code. Uh, it's very powerful. Um, I, if you haven't uh, experienced it, I would highly recommend just kind of, you know, scoping that out. Um, but um, there has been some notions in terms of with regards to programming, especially um, um, in, in CS courses that pair programming where two people working together results in a better quality of code. Um, so Nicholas is looking at if one person is working with the AI, what quality of code that, that results in. And then also if we have two people and the AI working where we have this basically three uh, uh, heads working on this, uh, this code together, which includes the AI, how do we effectively present that information? And also how do we coordinate uh, collaboration so that the, uh, uh, the outcome is, um, I guess, more optimal um, than if someone's working by themselves and also without the AI agent. Um, also to emphasize, um, uh, none of this work would be ha uh, happening um, without my students. Um, you saw pictures of my other two, uh, Jawad and Nicholas, and then here's some of the other folks that have um, uh, I've been lucky to work with in my lab. And um, I think that pretty much concludes what I wanted to talk about today. Um, and also here are some of my contact information if you um, want to um, get in touch with me. And also want to emphasize that um, this line of thinking in terms of being really human-centric, there's a whole, um, uh, society of us, um, uh, human factors and ergonomic society. So this was a picture of us at, at that society meeting um, uh, last month. Um, so yeah, um, I'll be more than happy to take any questions at this point. Great, thank you, Sarah. I think Jake actually posed a question in the Q&A forum. All can right. you it up or I can read it to you. Oh yeah, sure, that'd be great. Okay, so Jake asks, can you expand upon the trust factor with AI? For example, what is the balance to justifying a relationship identified using AI or incorrectly dismissing a relationship that is currently unknown, yet is still a signal? All right, so let me kind of read this. Sorry, I kind of whizzed right through that. No, no, no worries <laughs> at all. Um, so I think... Um, what I'm trying to emphasize is that we need to make sure that trust is taken into account. Um, I think ultimately at the end of the day, if people don't trust AI, they're not going to use it. And no matter how great AI is um, and people don't trust it, it's not going to be uh, adopted, um, which is a little bit problematic. Um, so uh, kind of going back to the graph that I presented, um, we want to make sure that the AI's capability matches in um, the person's mental model that those two things match. Um, and I guess the mechanism to do that right now, um, instead of having like, I guess, a brain computer interface or something that's very super duper advanced, that the way that we can do that is through these explanations. And, but this is really important to figure out what these explanations should look like. Um, and then also, the surrounding aspects that need to go into um, the explanation as their timing, their form, um, and then also the individual as, as well, um, and also the context in terms of their the, the, the circumstance where they are presented with this um, explanation. I don't know if that answers your question, Jake. Thank you. And we are coming up on our time, and I do want to make sure that um, I do give you guys the opportunity to take a, a break if you need to. The next virtual session will start at 1145 uh, on uh, data and environmental resilience. There is a separate Zoom link for that. It's 
found in the program page as well as on the website under the live stream with a different passcode. So you'll need to log out of here and log into that or feel free to live stream the event that is taking place in the ballroom. And I'd like to go ahead and thank all of our panelists. And I did put in the chat here all of their contact information so you could reach out to them directly if you have any follow-up questions. And thank you so much to all of you for a wonderful round of lightning research talks on data design.